then we'll discuss a little bit about existing broker architectures and how people solve this. And then I'll introduce to you to the new broker architecture, how we have done it, and, uh, and some of the features that's going to come up. And then I'll discuss about uh, use cases. So let's talk about what is messaging. So bro, we, uh, in typically, uh, when you integrate systems and we want to do uh, interactions with, with uh, different systems, uh, normally what we do is, or most often, we do RPC-style communication. What, we, what I mean by that is we do, might do web services, REST-based services, or thrift kind of things. But then again, this has inherent problems. For example, it could be response, request response style and it could be that uh, both parties has to be online when the, uh, the messaging happens. And uh, maybe uh, you, can't, you won't be able to do uh, like fire and forget kind of things. So, but then again, there are seven other possibilities that we can do. Uh, for example, you can uh, save the message in some place so that uh, the, when the other recipient comes online, then it can be delivered. That kind of stuff. So in order to do all that kind of possibilities, what you need to have is some kind of broker to make the integration happen. So, so when we talk about messaging, there are a couple of messaging models that's, that exist. The first one is uh, queues, where you keep on sending messages, and there will be a one person who's going to receive each message. And uh, the other uh, 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 paradigm is the topics pub submodel, where you keep on sending messages, and each subscriber will re uh, receive a copy of it. And uh, there will be another variation, which is kind of the almost uh, it's the same as a uh, uh, pub submodel, but then again, we call it durable subscription. Where what's happening here is that uh, 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 receiving part doesn't have to be online. So uh, uh, when the message is sent, it's going to be stored by a broker. And when the message receiving party comes online, it's going to be delivered to the, that client. And when you want to say that I don't want no more messages, what happens is you need explicitly have to say unsubscribe. So that's what we call durable subscriptions. And this is the kind of uh, the, the messaging models that, that's out there normally. And uh, but then again, when you install a broker into your environment, typically you won't, uh, you won't be running more than one node. The reasons, for, reasons such as performance, it could be uh, fault tolerance, that kind of aspects, because of that, what you get is uh, distributed versions of all these uh, messaging models. For example, it's distributed queues. What's going to happen is, uh, let's say, uh, when you have a broker cluster, you will be sending, keep on sending messages to uh, uh, different brokers, and uh, you can connect to any of these broker nodes and receive messages. But one thing to note here is that you will not get a, a global guarantee uh, for the, the order that you're going to receive messages. So the, that's kind of relaxed form of uh, 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 the message ordering. So, so different brokers solves, uh, implements these uh, paradigms in different ways, and, and we, this is kind of a, a short survey of, of how people do this. So uh, uh, the first uh, 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 scenario we see is that the master slave, which is not really a scaling uh, scheme, it's basi basically a, a fault tolerance scheme where the one broker will keep on uh, working, and if that goes down, the slave will take over and keep on working again. So uh, with that, uh, then the second model is uh, where you have a queue distribution, where not only not every queue exists in the, each broker. So what's going to happen in, in that, such a situation, if suppose uh, 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 some guy send a message to a broker where the queue doesn't exist, that, that broker has to send the message uh, to the place where the queue ex actually exists. So there's some kind of a transmission happening uh, within the brokers. The other uh, 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 third uh, scenario is that you will have client connections, where a client actually decides a, a where to send the message. It could be dynamic. It would be some kind of static configuration where you keep on sending messages based on some criteria. Third model is queuing networks, where 
uh, uh, there will be uh, the brokers is set up in such a topology where uh, the, when someone sends a message, it keeps on getting routed until it gets delivered to some place. So uh, uh, different brokers implement over this kind of uh, topologies to implement uh, uh, solve this problem, and it has its comparative merits. So what, what, what we want to note in all these models is that more, most, most of the time the broker will keep the local persistent layer and keep on storing these messages there and keep then transmit the message. Now that becomes a problem. When a, a large messages are involved, then that transmission overhead becomes a problem. So uh, that's something that we, we thought we might want to solve. So with, uh, with that thing, uh, that, uh, that understanding in our mind, what we did with our message broker is to not to route messages over the network. What we want to do is to a kind of uh, store that message in a persistent layer, which can scale separately. So, uh, and use a kind of a, a distributed coordination framework to keep the uh, global state known to each node. So, in that way, uh, uh, for that we actually use Hazelcast. This, this, when we do that, what, this is what you get. So, uh, we basically avoid uh, routing over the network. So some more design objectives for the message broker is to have a pluggable and scalable storage, which can scale separately. And, and, and uh, because the nowadays databases are kind of quite fast with the SSD and backed hard drives. And then we want to uh, uh, have high performance for obvious reasons and the availability, fault tolerance, and all that. And uh, simplify the deployment patterns. And basically what we want to achieve is to have broken node startup and dynamically connect, or maybe it could be well-known addresses. Then once you connect it, then you can keep on sending messages to any of the node, and it should work. You don't have to be statically configuring all these routes and everything. So then we want to build a, a, a kind of extensible core which is high performant and wrap that by various protocols that's out there. It will be for this release, it's going to be AMQP, and then we are inventing, we're going to uh, release MQTT support as well. And that's one of the design objectives. So, going deeper into how uh, 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 it is designed, is basically uh, when you want to do distributed queues. Uh, 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 in order to deliver, guarantee some kind of global ordering, you need to have at least uh, some kind of a, a per message ordering. But we, that's, that's going to be a kill the performance, and it's not really practical. But instead, what we do is we uh, do coordinate based on the, uh, num uh, messages, batches, what we call, we term them as BMS slots. What's going to happen, let's, let's assume a, a scenario where you have three nodes in the cluster, Let's say node one, node two, node three, and uh, let's say you uh, that is backed by maybe it could be a, a rational database, it could be a database cl a cluster of, uh, of Cassandra nodes, and uh, what's going to happen is uh, let's say publisher one keeps on publishing messages to a node one, and uh, when it reaches a thousand messages, uh, then uh, it will keep, uh, keep up, uh, telling this uh, special node that we call coordinator, which is kind of leader for the cluster, saying, okay, I got thousands of messages which can be delivered to someone who's interested. So this keeps on happening, this interaction. In the meantime, there will be a, a subscriber coming to the node one itself, node two itself. So this guy wants messages. So what's going to happen is, so uh, this uh, slot of messages will be assigned for the subscriber. So the first thousand of nodes, uh, messages, will be delivered to the subscriber. And uh, in parallel, there will be a, another uh, subscriber coming for the same queue, asking for messages. So what then happens is that now this guy is the leader. So we, you will go and ask for messages. So it, uh, so the, 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 this state is maintained in the distributed uh, kind of distributed map using Hazelcast, and uh, the second node, uh, second thousand of, uh, 
messages will be assigned for the subscriber. So that's with this approach, uh, the, all the nodes knows about the global state. We, uh, what I mean by that is uh, uh, the subscribers and, and, and the, the queues and everything that, uh, that makes up the, uh, the, the global state is known to all the members in the cluster. So, uh, so for example, then there are scenarios like, suppose now the subscriber leaves in the while consumed messages, and what's going to happen is then the, that, that slot, uh, the, uh, the remaining messages of that slot will be rescheduled to some other guy to consume. So that kind of things we handle, if, let's say uh, the node goes down, then those messages and the queues will be reassigned to someone who can consume it. Uh, so that basically uh, uh, explains what I already said. Uh, moving on, to, uh, this is uh, uh, another view of the, uh, the broker architecture that we have implemented, uh, where what we do here is, uh, 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 basically you have three uh, 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 parts, that, that performance critical parts in the broker architecture. The first one we call it uh, inbound, inbound part, the other one is the outbound part. What we do here is, for example, uh, all the messages and the events coming from each of these uh, transports will be added to a, a, a data structure we call a ring buffer. So this is, uh, then there will be other events such as UI events and important server events. We add all that into a ring buffer and we keep on, uh, uh, there will be a piece of logics that uh, act on these events in a log-free manner. So this is uh, a kind of interesting data structure which is uh, developed by these, uh, uh, these guys called LMAX Exchange. So what this gives is better performance rather than using a conventional data structures for internet communication. For, uh, for example, uh, in Java case, it could be concurrent linked list. That sucks when it comes to performance. But that's why they have implemented this uh, disruptor pattern and we are adopting it for our architecture gives us better performance. So eventually, uh, uh, what's going to happen is uh, the, all the messages will go to the database, ultimately. And then again, uh, in the outbound path, what's going to happen is, uh, let's say a subscriber comes to this, uh, uh, this node and asks for, uh, ask for messages. So this guy will connect to the uh, coordinator node and get a slot assigned for this subscriber. Then it will go and uh, get some metadata about the messages, not the actual payload, and uh, assign that, that put that information into the outbound disruptor. This will go in parallel and get all these payloads, and on the last time that we about to deliver the message via the transport. So that's basically how this thing works, and this architecture actually gave us better performance than the previous version, and uh, so, we, so that's why we are going to go ahead with it. In the WSU platform also, there are certain situations that we are going to adapt this uh, disruptor pattern. So, uh, so that's basically how we have implemented it. And then again, I now want to talk about a little bit about new features that we're going to bring in. We, uh, in the previous version, we supported Cassandra as a persistent layer. But then again, now uh, we want to simplify the deployments that we can do with the message broker. So we have implemented the RDBMS support as well. So we are initially will going go ahead with uh, support for my, uh, uh, Microsoft SQL, Oracle, and MySQL. The H2 database is inbuilt. Uh, so you can bring up one pack uh, and start working with it. And uh, then we are working, we uh, improved the flow control mechanisms, which I'm going to talk about next, and the support for MQTT, and some general improvements that we have done. So talking a little bit about back pressure, so it's very important that a running server safeguard itself from, from a, 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 sudden bursts of uh, incoming traffic. So in order to do that, we have implemented this thing called uh, back, uh, flow control, which is kind of standard for every, every, any broker. And uh, we actually improved it. 
So uh, we can do a, 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 a flow control based on the global uh, thresholds that you can configure, and we can do, do that for uh, all c per connection as well. So what's going to happen is, let's say, a, a, some connect, uh, a, a client will keep on sending lots of messages, and it's, di it's difficult to sustain the ra rate that he's uh, sending in. We can actually say, hey, stop sending stuff uh, temporarily until further notice. And once we have some kind of breathing space, then we can actually re-enable it. Actually, AMQP supports this. So in the protocol level, then, so we can do this. And we can actually stop processing in a meaningful manner rather than throwing random, random errors like others do uh, uh, where, when we detect global error conditions. For example, let's say you have a Cassandra cluster configured to work with uh, the message broker. Let's say you can't meet the read consistency or write consistency levels, so we can actually hold uh, the, the things that we are about to write and then again stop accepting messages, etc. And once this uh, problem is sorted out, we can actually bring it on, uh, keep, start working again. So that's kind of uh, improvements that we have done for uh, 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 fault tolerance aspect. Another important feature that we have built is a, a support for AMQP. No, MQTT, uh, which is a lightweight uh, topic-based protocol designed for uh, Internet of Things use cases. And uh, we're actually going to imp be implementing all the uh, QoS levels, for example, uh, the Atmos delivery, where you can keep on firing uh, messages in a fire-and-forget manner, or you can actually wait for an act. Uh, to be received, and uh, or the other way is like you keep on sending a send message, then the server or the recipient will keep on sending an act, and act is acknowledged again, and that kind of stuff. So this is like protocol specific uh, interactions. Then now we we basically implement it. So uh, then uh, hierarchical topics and wildcard subscri subscriptions, etc. So uh, yeah, so. Uh, some general improvements we have done is we are implementing some graphs and statistics, basically uh, let you know about read the database read-write latencies. For example, you are running a, a production broker cluster, then you might want to decide, actually keep, uh, figure out quickly whether uh, the, uh, some kind of a uh, latency being added to the messages that are getting delivered, etc. And for that kind of information, it's very great to have some kind of drafts and, re and further debug uh, uh, a real uh, production uh, cluster using these statistics. And some performance improvements we have done is we, can, we actually revamped all uh, the thread, uh, uh, thread uh, uh, architecture for the broker based on the disruptor, and we are upgrade, moving to CQL driver-based uh, uh, driver to communicate with uh, Cassandra, but then Thrift is also supported, the Hector client, and which actually in turn gives us better support for latest Cassandra and data stacks versions. So, the roadmap. We uh, want to implement AMQP1 and the JMS on top of it very quickly, and we won't keep improving on the performance. Uh, uh, we have ideas about how to do that, and then uh, um, we want to uh, implement a Storm API uh, protocol, maybe over the web circuits. And uh, so that's the uh, immediate roadmap. There will be some others also. And uh, so, what makes WS2 broker? Difference. So we scale up in all three dimensions. What I mean by that is we can handle lots of load, and we can scale horizontally, and a number of topics and queues also we can handle a lot of uh, that, and the message sizes also, because we don't uh, transmit through the network and congest the network. And uh, support for Cassandra and the uh, rational database is kind of unique. And we want to simplify the cluster deployments, which leads to a minimal deployment effort and the learning curve and the maintenance. And we deeply integrate with WS2 ESP. In fact, you can install any, uh, the entire MB feature on top of ESP and augment its capabilities. So uh, that's, with that, uh, uh, I want to talk a, 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 a frequent use case. Uh, using ESB and ESB, uh, ESB and the MB. 
uh, what we call this is store and forward, where you keep, a client keep on sending messages to ESB, and ESB will save in turn these messages for the, in the broker in a queue. And there will be another uh, component in the uh, in the uh, ESB, which will retrieve these messages and keep on sending to the server. So what you get with this is guaranteed in-order delivery. And for example, suppose the server is kind of slow for the client, you can uh, basically rate limit uh, the, 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 the messages that's been sent to the uh, backend servers. And uh, so the next one. Next use case is uh, about MQTT where you can have a, a, this basically an article that, uh, that was written before and uh, by one of our engineers, and it's out there in, uh, in, in this link. Uh, basically, what, what you have here is a kind of sensor that detects the, uh, the temperature and the humidity uh, in a room and um, sends this information to a complex event processor using MQTT. And complex event processor will, in turn, uh, make a decision whether to switch off or switch on uh, the fans that's in the room. So once it's decided uh, it, that event will be published downstream and uh, via MQTT and received by a Raspberry Pi, which uh, in turn controls the fan. So that's kind of uh, 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 a small use case there. Yeah.